nightmare. Hello and welcome to Cinema Subculture, the podcast dedicated to strange and extreme cinema. My name's Gary. And I'm Simon. This is episode 13. Yes. And we are discussing Carol Theodore Dreyer's Vampire. Yep, we are. I was really looking forward to watching this film, so yep. was. Um, and I was not let down. I really enjoyed it. It was kind of... I guess I was getting kind of expecting a, maybe a similar take to Nosferatu. Mm-hmm. But I was pleasantly surprised that it was it was obviously a similar subject matter, but it was a completely different take on the whole vampire lore, I thought. Yeah. Um, and obviously, yeah, yeah, basic elements kind of thing. But um, I was quite impressed. That, I mean, what was this, like 10 years after um, Nosferatu? Yeah. Yeah, that like, you know, it was still a fresh enough... And even with like, Dracula was out around about this time mm-hmm. as well. So, you know, it was still a fresh enough uh, subject matter yeah, yeah. to go a completely different way with it. I mean, it's almost like a... I don't know, just like a fantasy, you know, it's fantasy, but a, like a realistic fantasy, you know, whereas Nosferatu is more of a kind of stylized, very kind of gothic, um, yeah. the vampire is a monster, mm-hmm. whereas this is more of a kind of, it's almost like the, the main character of Angry's fear, you know, of, of everything, Yeah, yeah. you know, that kind of conjures up this world. Um, so I was quite, I was taken, but uh, it was good. I loved the look of it. Um, I thought it was interesting. The even though I mean it was made around obviously the same time as, um, as you know Universal's Dracula, but obviously it would have been a much lower budget, um, and like some of the, just the camera, you know, it looked like a silent film mm-hmm. and all, but like some of the camera techniques, like the movements, you know, I hadn't seen many silent films, you know, like the kind of the the tracking shots um, took me back a wee bit, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Some of the the, the amazing like. Uh, like shadow play, if you know what I mean, oh, really yeah. clever shadow play, and uh, some of the techniques with the. Well, I mean, we'll talk about it, but the run, like the the figure running across the stream, mm-hmm. but in the water, you know, yeah, what I mean? yeah. it just it was amazing. That I just was really kind of I couldn't believe. It was just weird watching like a kind of silent film with such kind of, I'd consider like, more advanced techniques yeah, like yeah. that. You know, like special effects really. You know what I mean? I thought it was just a sound, even though fairly basic, worked really well. Um, at no point did I. Did it feel out of place? You know, felt as if it worked. Even the stuff with the, you know, the way that he can uh, manage to still have the like, intertitles, mm-hmm. uh, but it, they felt more organic rather than letting, you know, other silent films where it's it's obvious it's splitting up in, you know, due to the lack of sound. This felt more like a subtle nar- narration. Okay, you know what I mean. Um, I thought that was it was integrated well, and then when it, later on it comes in, it's the book. Mm-hmm. I thought that worked really well as well. What did you think it, Gary? Stop me rambling on. I love this film. That's really only the uh, third major vampire film. Uh, yeah. If Kim Newman points out he's got an essay in the Criterion booklet. Sure. But it's interesting that Dreyer chooses to do something completely unconventional. It's really uh, kind of breaking down what the horror movie is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the fact he goes for a totally unconventional use of editing, camera work. Mm-hmm which um, breaks most of the what we think of as the rules of classical narrative, creates a really creepy atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And then I love Dreyer's visual style, like a really kind of austere, um, simplified, uh, bleak uh, sort of style he has, and then all the effects you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Also, also, you brought up the point of it's in kind of Grey's head. Yeah. You don't uh-huh. know what's mm-hmm. sort of... Dry asset sort of plays with the ideas of objectivity and subjectivity, mm-hmm. which kind of goes against the classic horror style, like Nosferatu. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a monster movie, like yeah. the, the horror is real. Yes. Uh-huh. And this film, it's like, it's kind of mm, 50 50, it's a bit of both. Definitely. You don't quite know. I mean, you can tell, like, it's when you when the guy gets to the, the inn at the beginning, and I mean, he like, looks out and he sees the, like, the figure. And at first I was like, kind of, oh, like, what's this, this, this guy doing? Uh-huh. But as soon as he sits in the boat, it's like, it's death. That's what he's seen. Yeah. You know, and, you know the scythe, that's what he's seen. You know what I mean? It's like, and like, I think that the commentary was pointing out that, that that could be just like in his all in his head as well because yeah. he's seen it so, like, it's, he's seen, you know, the detail. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like he's looking at it supposedly from afar, but he's seen such detail in the characters. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's, it's almost like he's... He's got some irrational fear in his brain like from the, the, the start, you yeah. know what I mean? Maybe he's away from his family or something, you know what I mean? He's out mm. on his own in a strange place, you know what I mean? 
he's just got a total kind of just a lot of fear of uh-huh. where he is maybe in the situation yeah because one of the first uh, explanatory mm-hmm. intertitle cards it uh, talks about uh, Grey as a man he's interested in the supernatural mm-hmm. sometimes he can't uh, distinguish reality from fiction yeah that's quite interesting how Dreyer explores that because you think of it kind of circumvents the sort of cliches that you sometimes get in supernatural style horror where you've got like something like Nightmare on Elm Street is a supernatural uh, villain mm-hmm. but you've got the main protagonist who's trying to get other people to believe her yes or uh-huh. whatever uh-huh. That, that it's actually happening and it's uh, when it, when they finally realise it's a bit too late um, uh-huh. Uh-huh. whereas Dreyer kind of undercuts that so that's not really necessary the the evil is possibly it's not a subjective or object, objective it's kind of both because mm-hmm. uh, yeah. I mean people who believe in ghosts and stuff uh, the sort of scientific answer is it's like in their head sure. to, a, to a large extent mm-hmm. and it's interesting how Dreyer kind of he's not going it either way but he's because like he's no point in doing a horror movie like that mm-hmm. really uh, it has to be objective to some extent or what's the point of kind of telling the film I guess, it's all I dream but uh, yeah I mean I guess coming to what you're saying about people that believe in ghosts it's mm-hmm. like it's, it's the same type of thing if they believe in this fear or whatever they feel, it's real it's, mm. it's real to them you know and that's what it you know to to, to Alan Gray like that's it, it feels like it's totally real for him mm. you know what I mean whether it's a dream or whatever you know um, it's just that belief or like yeah. the kind of I don't know like, I mean I, I I I don't particularly believe in ghosts or anything like that mm. but like I tripped myself I saw one right. you know <laughs> you know I'm still I still have that kind of rational fear even though I don't really believe I will say I'm too scared to believe right. <laughs> you know um, but yeah it's, it's totally it's, mm. um, it's really cleverly done so I think it was in production in like 1931 yeah but mm. I think I read that um, the studio Ufa, the German studio, mm-hmm. actually wanted it held back from release so it didn't get released to 32 to let like uh, Dracula, the Universal one, yeah. get released first. Yeah. Which was a bit. Um, it's totally dry. I thought that can hurt me a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I could see that at the time, but mm. um, had it been like, you know, today, I think both those films come out, I think this would have probably done better. Mm. You know, if, you know, if similar films were, were released today, mm-hmm. just because. By most terms, Dracula is so mainstream now. You th- we think I would think of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, this is this was just a. It's quite an original. You know, it's it's. I mean, it's a vampire film. It's completely a vampire film, whether you think it's all in his head or not. But we don't see a fang. Yeah. You know what I mean? We do see, you know, a, a puncture wound on the neck, but it's not your traditional kind of, you know, two hole puncture wound. There's no like avert like crosses. You know, there's none of the, the, yeah, the yeah. major tropes, but it still manages to. So I mean, it's like it's kind of. When I was thinking about it, when I was talking about like, is it on his head? It's almost like he's heard a story about mm. a vampire, yeah, but, but not not knowing what they are, and he's only kind of lately heard what they do, mm-hmm. and this is him forming this dream around that idea. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Because mm-hmm. um, it has the ma- major points, but it kind of misses a lot of the kind of finer detail that is introduced in other films. If you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Um, and he's even Nosferatu, you know? Yeah. Um, so it is, it's it's really quite it's it's a, an interesting way to take the the vampire film. One thing I thought was um, interesting coming from like the kind of expectation of the kind of Nosferatu thing. Um, although I, I I think like Max Schreck performance is amazing. A lot of the characters surrounding the fi- and you know and supporting characters in that film are a bit well they're, they're silent performances. You know what I mean? They're very they're quite over the top. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, very extravagant, you know, big hands, whatever. But I thought the performances in this were very subtle and very real. Yeah. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Even the, the main character who apparently wasn't, he's, he never acted after this, apparently. No. It was, it was not something or before, he was, aye. Yeah, was he not something to do with getting the money for it? Yeah, or? He, well, he produced it, Baron Nicholas de Gunsberg. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was perfectly believable. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, he didn't have lots to play, but the, the what he did have to play, like, you know, uh, worked really well, and the, the girl that played. Um, Leon, right, yeah, um, the, the system, yeah, yeah, yeah. She, I thought she was really. I mean, when she when she has that kind of crazed look in her, yeah, eyes. I thought that was really good, um, but I thought all the you know the supporting characters, as I say, with the kind of silent film aesthetic, you think it's going to be kind of overplayed Aye. sometimes. Um, I thought it was very subtle mm-hmm. and kind of real, you know. Aye. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's mostly non-actors. 
Really? Yeah. Right. The only one I thought was a little, but it worked for the 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 way the character was was the the, the other sister. She was very kind of like it felt very kind of um, one dimensional, just kind of stat like very kind of. Okay. But but that was I mean, her sister was maybe dying and her dad had just died. You know, so it looked very kind of like catatonic almost. You know uh, what I mean? Mm-hmm. There wasn't much going on, so it kind of worked for the character. But I don't know if that mm-hmm. was intentional or if mm-hmm. it was just. But I thought I thought still thought that worked. But that was the only person I didn't think had much to do necessarily. Aye. Um, yeah, Dry doesn't really go for much kind of psychological depth. Many mm-hmm. the characters like Grey, we really don't know much about. No. Him. Just turns up. Uh, we know he's interested in supernatural things. Yeah, and he kind of wanders about. Like, it gives it more strangeness, maybe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Than having more kind of everything explained. Definitely. And a yeah. psychological uh, motivation type thing. Add to the atmosphere, I think. Definitely. Yeah, I'm on this. I mean, there was, there was plenty, there was, as I say, without going the kind of Nosferatu route of the kind of, you know, the monster movie, I thought this was still really creepy a lot, a yeah, lot of the yeah. time, you know what I mean? And then there was a lot of later moments as well, I thought, like, mm-hmm. kind of, the doctor and the, the kind of peg leg banjo player. Yeah. Um, worked really well. I was really impressed, as I say, with the kind of, like, the, the, the effects, like, the, the shadow play, and mm-hmm. even the, um, when like Alan Great like he splits into two, yeah, or three, yeah, whatever. Right. But near the end, um, when it's like you know he's kind of semi-transparent. Mm-hmm. So that was you know it's just things that I don't know. Just that wee bit step more advanced than what I expected to see. I guess. Right, okay. Again, like, then working with low budget and things like that. You just yeah. it was just it was it was really well done. I thought it did leave me wondering, wee, and I know I kind of know how these things are done nowadays. But you just <laughs> you start thinking, what can I? You know, what kind of techniques did they have available? Yeah. But after I finished watching it, I was trying to remember if there was any... Because obviously they did a lot of tracking shots early in the film. I was trying to remember if there was any of those shots that had tracking. Because, I mean, that would have been now impossible to do those shots and, you know, and then repeat it. Right, aye. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, the only bit I thought, like, I, I was really... Was when he was into the... Back into the trap door. You know, because uh, the door's right. the door's solid. You know, it okay. looks solid. Mm. So again, that would have been I don't know, but uh, I guess he kind of looks not as transparent when he's in there. But I don't know. As I say it worked, and as I say, it did leave me kind of thinking. I wonder how they did that back yeah. then. Yeah. Um, as I say, it's something that's so easy now. Mm-hmm. You can do it in two seconds on a computer. Mm. But um, just you know, they're working with like tape and razors to cut yeah. the tape, the film together, and that's, that's if they got right. the shot. Um, and I mean development time and stuff like that so it's really it was it really impressed me mm-hmm. and when i look at that was there any stuff like in these other like in like uh was it the passion of joan of arc joan of arc was there any like kind of effects like that and uh, that I how, think how so. much earlier was that uh well, that was 1927 right right yeah that's more just a kind of realist Got style yeah. um mm-hmm. most of these films are like that as far as i know mm-hmm. the ones i've seen uh i think this is the only one he kind of explores the special mm-hmm. effects but it was it was really well done. Even down to the simple, well, simpler um, reverse shots of the the shadow digger. Oh, the I, digger. I yeah, mean that yeah. was really well yeah. done as well. I mean that was easier to work out how he did that if you know what I mean. But when I first saw the Alan, Alan Gray like going to pat over the next to the lake, mm-hmm. and I could see the figure in the lake, I did. I'm like, again, it's such an easy easy technique now. Yeah, but um, makes you wonder how even experimented to get that look mm. you know what I mean what made him think yeah you know uh, I, I mean I don't know if, if it had been done much before that um, but as I say it was, it was well done so this was this was Dryer's first film with audio at all yeah well with first, sound sorry yeah. not mm. audio with, with you know with uh, dialogue and stuff like that. so how did mm. that like come about like what was he was he kind of looking to experiment with that or it was um was it something that was put on, put on him, or I guess it was getting to that kind of time in film. I eh? think he, we kind of had to. Nineteen thirty one, it was produced, so um, still only four years since sound came in mm-hmm. in America in nineteen twenty seven. Right, and I think that had quite a devastating effect on the European film industry mm-hmm. because <clears throat> what language do you make it in? Right, yeah. like, that was the the kind of universality of film. Before that, yeah, it's yeah. like it had no country, yeah. And then it's coming, a sound broke that down. Apparently, they shot like all the scenes like with dialogue anyway three times. Yeah, I mean, again, it's it's uh, something that is pretty standard 
mm-hmm. or had, became standard. Um, but I think that would probably have been yeah. back at the beginning of that. Um, Going from making such simple felt, well, easy, straightforward, not having to worry about, you know, sound syncing, anything like that, um, to then having to shoot the thing three times, mm. having to like, um, reduce your picture. Mm. Those you know, they had to change, you know, well, the aspect ratios that are one one nineteen, yeah, yeah, one one nineteen one, mm. um, because they had to put the soundtrack. Aye, <laughs> they, you know what I mean. Aye. Going from like one extreme to another, almost yeah, yeah. Uh, making it so complicated, um, must have been quite a transition. I mean, mm. we spoke about this before when we were talking about freaks. Aye, you know, the kind of transition into sound, but mm. um, yeah, because I mean, probably what a lot of people would criticise the film for was it's half a sound film. But there's probably too much reliance on uh, written text. Mm-hmm. But yeah. yeah, he was in a difficult position. I think the reason the dialogue is there, but it's kind of minimal, is to deal with the problems of they had to like do everything three times, um, and then uh, post sync it. Um, what languages was it originally acted in? I think it will be German first, mm-hmm. and then they uh, did it for French and English. Oh, really? Although I read that the English version of the film was never actually finished. Right. Somehow. So. Yeah. At, at, at the beginning of the DVD, it was saying about how most of the negatives were destroyed. Aye. How, how did that come about? I know that with Nosferatu, there was obviously like legal issues and yeah. stuff like that. Was that a similar um, affair? It's a bit about the restoration. And, yeah. Doesn't say. Just says no. it's lost. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's just the versions that remain are prints struck from the original negatives. And some the of it looked, too. some of it looked really, really yeah. good. Some of it was really, you know, um, obviously had been through a lot. Of, you know what I mean? Aye. But some of it looked really, really good. I've mm-hmm. got to admit, you know, um, for you know, not being from the original negative. Aye. Um, it was a similar thing with Passion of Joan of Arc, Joan of Arc, though. Yeah. It? Not like the lot was it destroyed or that was? <clears> I think it was. Lost or it was destroyed in a fire mm-hmm. or something. It's crazy. Isn't yeah, it? then it's it turned like... up in a Norwegian mental institution. <laughs> <laughs> they show it to the inmates, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just crazy. Like the thought of these, you know, films. It's Aye. like it's like the whole thing with it, like the BBC. Like you know, they used to tape over all the like mm. the old episodes of like Doctor Who and stuff right. like that. Loads of them have been destroyed forever because they used to tape over them. Yeah, yeah. Because they never thought there'd be any kind of aftermarket, like after you know, uh, broadcast. I know. Business, but um, who would have first seen Blu ray in 1932? Uh, uh, true, true, <laughs> but I don't know. It's just the thought, of, like, yeah, even just the original negative, not yeah. being, I don't know. Like, uh, oh, well, we've made the film, we've got like five prints of it. What big deal this negative? Burn it, Burn yeah, it. <laughs> get in the bin, <laughs> you know. What I mean, it just it kind of, woofed. yeah, and, I um, <clears throat> I think I heard something like half of all silent films ever produced are lost, right. I think part of that's maybe due to the fact that we were filmed in nitrate mm-hmm. film, which is highly flammable. Yes, uh, I. Uh, <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> it helps with the burning. Um, yeah. Um, where were we before we said oh, that? Talking talking about, about, yeah, the, the use of the text. Yes. I think that's valid criticism to some extent that he maybe uses them a bit too much because they are extremely long. And really descriptive, maybe overly descriptive. I did get the feeling like it was like, like taking like verbatim from the script. Right. Mm. You know what I mean? It was uh, almost like, um, but I think the way he was shooting it, he wasn't trying, he wasn't wanting to sh- shoot too much like, exposition. So right. that was his way of getting it over. And, mm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, they are they're longer than probably in titles in a silent, in a, a fairly silent film. Yeah. You know, you don't usually get less information. Although more of them, um, but they were they were quite ready. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you've got the book as well, exp- explaining the vampire mythology, yep. mm-hmm. um, which also happens in Nosferatu, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's how- le- there's less of it, I think, in it. In Nosferatu? Yeah. Right, I, I couldn't so. quite remember can't how quite much remember they either, used that. I'm, I'm sure it's only like one or two scenes in the, when things at the end, at the beginning. Right, okay. Before he goes to the castle. Right. I'm sure of it, but I could be wrong. Uh, someone brought up maybe the fact that they had to have that in there because the vampire mythology wasn't quite established right. at that time. Mm-hmm. Maybe he could have done it somehow with dialogue, but uh, maybe like sort of a villager or something who knew the, the mythology because yeah. this has happened 
mm-hmm. it seems in the village before for a while. The yeah, vampire has been there. Aye, and that that guy like that's reading it. The second guy is yeah. reading it. The the kind of housekeeper guy, I guess. Aye, the Alfred. Right. Um, <laughs> he doesn't. He's like, this is news to me. Aye, you know? yeah. <laughs> <He's> <laughs> like, the bit. Yeah, aye. Um, <laughs> It's in a book. I, don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess that could be fed back into the whole dream thing, but then, I don't know. Mm. Um, um, yeah, I mean, watching it now, though, I, I quite like the book because it's so mm-hmm. different mm-hmm. than just like a guy explaining the, the yeah, backstory. Yeah, that, that's uh, what I'm saying. Like, yeah, you know, it works pretty well. Even the, the, the stuff before that didn't, mm-hmm. you know, didn't bother me. Uh, um, I thought it was a kind of nice way to let you get back to the story. Yeah. You know, once we went back to the images and uh, you get back to the kind of what was happening there and then. But saying that, it does, uh, you mentioned his use of sound. It's mm-hmm. actually quite interesting in a lot of ways um, how the scenes we are, he kind of plays with a diegetic and non-diegetic sound. You've got the score going, and then there's one scene like Grey's kind of looking about, and he kind of looks through a window, and he looks around, and there's some kind of party going on, folk mm-hmm. dancing, and there's like folk music. Yep. And then it cuts from the score to the folk music back to the score, the folk music again right it's kind of weird uh, yeah, yeah. I think it adds to the effect of is it real is it mm-hmm. is it not um, cutting from that reality of film to the watching a film the non-reality yeah um, and, and again being like kind of fairly early in the era of sound like, yeah. you know um, in dialogue it's quite clever you know it's quite a, a cl- clever technique to be using aye um you know, going for, as you say, going from a score mm. to like, for, you know, sound that's meant to be mm-hmm. happening there and then. Yeah. And then there's also places where there's a lot of, he uses some weird noises, like mm-hmm. animal sounds, like, yeah. mm-hmm. it's like got actors said to make like uh, parrot. Yeah. Mocking parrots and dog sounds, sounds and yeah, yeah. it's kind of meshing that in with the score. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really effective. So, see, you would, you'd have thought it's just like, all right, it's a, it's a sort of score, take the score bang it on mm-hmm. there's no it's just it's a kind of they were kind of separate mm-hmm. in a lot of ways in the silent era like um, but Dreyer kind of uh, gets them to work pretty well together yeah uh-huh. also the fact that it's kind of stop starts a lot of the time yeah no, it yeah, I kind of jump I wasn't kind of 100% sure so some, there's some points where the sound just cuts and I wasn't sure whether that was something to do with lost like audio Mm. I wasn't sure, like, right. but um, there are some cases where it was quite effective, and if you know, if it was made, you know, I wasn't sure Aye. if it was purposeful mm-hmm. or not. Um, but yeah, it was, it was well done. As I say, you see, in silent films, it's generally like it's an accompaniment, yeah, just to be there so that there's no si- that, so it's not silent. Mm. You know what I mean? It's mm. almost a, a part, as you say, from the the picture. But this definitely felt like it was designed for the film. So. Um... The film comes up with quite a, a different mm-hmm. take on the vampire mythology. Mm. Uh, yeah, you know a bit more about that than me, Sam. Well, Do you want to? Only from what Buffy the Vampire is. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, all the kind of basics are there. Um, I like the line in the book where it says about the staking. Right. Was to nail them to the earth. I thought that was interesting. Okay, yeah. It's never really been kind of, you know, because staking, you could stake them stirring up, lying mm-hmm. down, you know, right. jumping up. Aye. You know, in modern vampire tales, but um, this seems it's like a very figurative. You know, it's keeping them there almost. Right, you know, the yeah. stake. I quite like that. I mean, it was it was kind of I, I was interesting the kind of take on the turning because it wasn't really it wasn't as if the vampire was a appeared to be even the lore according to the book was going to. It did mention that you know they would eventually become vampires themselves, the victims, right? Mm-hmm. right? <clears throat> but it also then went on to say that it slowly drove them to commit suicide yeah. but then that then mean but then they were talking about that was a souls going to the dark one the dark prince um, but would that then make them return as vampires anyway I wasn't sure mm. that was a wee bit unclear I wasn't sure you know because one minute saying they would turn them into vampires yeah but then I guess uh, the, the 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 lead vampire what was her name um, Marguerite, Marguerite Chopin, Chopin yeah, yeah. Um, she was supposed to, there was something that happened to her wasn't there and that's the, you know it wasn't like she was turned into a vampire it was right. something that happened during her life yeah so it's something uh, like, it was like she almost, was evil in yeah, life or something like that it was like almost like an unrestful spirit that mm. they were talking about vampires and so I, I quite liked that it was, a, it was again it was a different take yeah um, unusually a, a female vampire yeah 
Well, and a, yeah, an old. I, I didn't realise that till the dude was reading the book. Right. Like, I thought it was a dude. Oh, I did you? Uh, <laughs> it, like, um, if anyone's ever seen, um, you ever seen the original Doctor Who? Again, uh, the no, well, the guy was the, he was played by uh, William Hartnell. Right. Right. And it, I swear to God, like it just looked like him. So I was just presuming it was a dude, right, right. all the way through until um, that wee guy was reading the book. Okay. And it was Margaret Chopin, and then it was I think it was even until you got to her grave and, and you saw her face in the the, the coffin. Right. Uh, I was like, oh that was it all the time. Because I just I just presumed it was a guy. I don't uh, know why. So but uh, yeah, that was un- that was unusual. Yeah. Um, I guess that was kind of coming from the is it Carmilla Carmilla. Yeah, the the novel the, the nov- the, the, yeah, that part, that it's based partly, on yeah, you know, inspired. But yeah, I mean, most of the vampire tricks, as I say, we didn't get any fangs or anything like that, but I think it wasn't missed, you know what I mean? It was all the luring the, the victim out into the, the, the wilderness. Aye. It was very, that was more or less, well, from what I remember from the, the, the film, I can't quite remember the book, but, you know, straight out of Bram Stoker's Dracula. Right. You know what I mean? Like, um, luring them out and stuff. So it was all, it was very, as I say, it definitely felt like it was coming from the imagination, as in the character mm-hmm. of someone who'd heard the vamp- about vampires, right, aye. but not maybe paid very much attention to them, yeah, and didn't know anything beyond that. If you know what I mean, hadn't you know the word part of pop culture? Obviously, <laughs> um, it was just like maybe maybe they'd heard of the film Nosferatu. You know what I mean? It was right, just okay. getting the basics. Mm-hmm. Um, but I thought it worked very well for that. I liked the, I mean, even the 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 horse driver, the cart driver. Right. He's away to the police, aye, and he comes back and he's just dead. I thought that was, that was very like vampire film. You right, know what okay. I mean? Yeah, um, got have the horse and cart in there. Yeah, oh, aye, aye. <laughs> um, so no, I, I liked it. As I say, it wasn't quite the traditional. Well, what I know is the kind of traditional vampire thing, but I thought it, it took it. It took it and went its own way with it. But as you've got kind of respect, mm-hmm. we spoke recently about making these films like modern in modern day. You know, like could you make a scary vampire film? That, aye, I think like that's again. This would be a perfect take. Like even if someone came out, came out with this now as a, as a take on vampires, I think it would have been quite interesting mm-hmm. to see. Yeah. Um. So it's quite refreshing. So I also puts forward the idea that if when someone gets bit, mm-hmm. they become a vampire, doesn't it? That's right. That's, yeah. Uh, that's so that's where I, I think. Uh, I, I, if you remember back right. to the vamp episode, I do remember I've, that. I've just. That's where um, obviously where I've took that from. Must have been Gary, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, to be fair, in, in in the original Universal Dracula, I'm sure that was a similar right, thing. I can't remember. And even in um. Think. I'm trying to remember. It maybe even in the the original Bram Stoker's Dracula book. Right. Okay. That 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 was just a bite that turned. Because I remember from the old Dracula TV show in the, I'm gonna say seventies eighties. It was in, I'm sure it was on on like British TV. It was like a kind of serial like serial. All right. Like maybe six episodes of, and it was based on Bram Stoker's Dracula, and they just turned. All right. Okay. In the mod, like uh, Coppola's. Uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula it was like an exchange of blood and I think before I don't think that was the first instance of that it was right. maybe a wee bit before that um, so that's a, that's a very modern thing I guess okay yeah. but um, that's just the way I know of it yeah yeah um, but I'd still say that was mere a zombie thing guy. I, yeah you're probably right but no no that's the, I, I mean if you're going to get in, if you're going to get your facts from this was a, this was a good film right. to get your facts from <laughs> Just saying, maybe you know, maybe update yourself a wee, wee tad. You know what I mean? Coming <laughs> to the, the this century, you know what I mean? I wonder if Ryan was just trying to. He wanted to make a supernatural film, but he wanted to not repeat Nosferatu, and so um, he went to a kind of different source. Yeah. Um, a different kind of uh, version. Maybe he just wanted to avoid the fucking legal stuff, man. Yeah, that's true. You know what yeah, I mean, you don't like, want to. Uh, I mean, uh, as I say, if you, I think this was the the only way he could have could have maybe got away with doing a vampire film. And not have it officially endorsed. Yeah, mm. you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, as I see, he probably saw what happened with Nosferatu and was like, "Yep, <laughs> like if I'm going to do vampire subject matter at all, yeah, or maybe maybe it, it was just he was making a supernatural film and he thought I'm going to stick two fingers up to these guys, you know, <laughs> and call it like vampire, you know yeah. what I mean, and, and have it kind of um, based. But I mean, it definitely it doesn't doesn't suffer from, you know. I say it's, it's a vampire film. It couldn't be any further away from Nosferatu. I don't yeah, think. Yeah, definitely. Um, but it doesn't suffer from it at all. You know Aye. what I mean? It's it's a completely fresh take. Yeah, because what we're saying, it's not about the vampire really. No, no, it's about no. Alan Gray's um, taking events. Mm-hmm. You only really see one attack. And yeah. It's like <clears throat> it's barely. You don't even know it's no. not a vampire attack really. Yeah, you don't exactly. Know what's going on. That's what I'm uh, saying. You don't get the kind of yeah. usual fangs or there's no bat turn and you know what I mean. There's no kind of there's no castle. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The only the, only, the, ma- the main vampire trope that's there 
that we have really is the coffins. You know, the kind of rising from the, the the coffin kind of thing. But I mean, as I said, it doesn't suffer from it, from it at all. It's a, it's a nice... It's a, as I said, it was very refreshing for me to watch. Because mm. there's so much of the kind of, you know, uh, standard vampire lore films out there, so many yeah. of them over the years, that just it's the same again and again and again. So this was really interesting to see. Like another way it could have went... Had had Universal's Dracula not come out that that year, maybe yeah. maybe things would have went a different way for vampires. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Um, so it was good. What did what was your kind of take on? Obviously, we're talking about like it being a dream or some sort of kind of alternate reality for Alan Gray. Mm. When he sat down on the bench, when he first of all, I didn't even realize that wee sister was away. Right, okay. Like, till he sees yeah, her, and the, yeah, yeah, I didn't get that the first time. There's a lot of things, like, it seemed to be um, elliptical, cutting mm. in time, forward in time. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, there was um, scenes that Dry had to cut out. Mm. I think the original version was a lot longer. Right. The, I think we know that from the historical record, uh, the version that got sent to the German censors. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I think he maybe had to cut scenes, but then he recut it to shorten it, mm-hmm. to kind of make out yeah, a shortened yeah. version if he had to get rid of stuff, so. Do those scenes exist? Like those, the, I don't commentary? think so. No. The, I was wondering nah. if on DVD because the the comment the the guy that does the commentary seemed to be under the impression they might have been reinserted back into the film, but they weren't. Right. Okay. Um, like there's close ups apparently for the for the staking that's Alan Gray that's actually doing the, the yeah. hammer and stuff mm. like that. But um, when that happens, that was the first kind of. Obviously, the weird stuff that was happening could have been put down to just a supernatural occurrence. Mm. This is the first time I thought like something. No, I don't. I don't know if this is all real. Aye. When that happened, because it was just kind of weird, and then he sees himself in the coffin. Yeah, again, that's that weird was really... because it's uh, three. Aha, uh-huh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Versions of him. That was really effective. I thought, like you know, um, seeing him in there and then seeing from his perspective and yeah. the drill sound, I thought was amazing. Like see when right, they're, they're, they're putting the the screws in, I thought that was really aye. creepy. Um, what do you think? What was that? Uh, I don't really know. Is it like, you know how like, I don't know, like maybe can I, if I take this as a dream, it's mm-hmm. almost, you know, how in, sometimes you have like a dream where something maybe happens and it's almost like you kind of know what's, it's maybe like a kind of, like a, you know, a physical representation of like, you know, he sees the, 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 the sister mm. and all, all these people and that turns out where they all are, you know, it's not just being a dream for that character at that point. Yeah. It's almost like a kind of precognitive, because it's all in his head, so he obviously he'll know where it all is. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah it's almost he... like his consciousness, like, uh, computing that. Mm-hmm. Back yeah, because he's quite uh, wary of the doctor mm-hmm. at that point. Um, yeah. So it's maybe like, because he has the blood uh, taken, yeah, like, then he gets woken up by like the he's so guy. fucking like He's, he's kind of sure that that doctor's not quite right already. Uh, but yeah, he lets some stick a needle in his arm. Yeah, well. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I thought that was kind of she's in, she needs blood, and yeah. then um, he's like, "Will you give yours?" And he turns around enough to say, "What?" <laughs> I just I just turned up at the door. I didn't even tell what's going on. Aye. This fella downstairs that did come into my bedroom last the night. <laughs> gave me a wee box. Um, aye. So then he gets woken up the housekeeper because mm-hmm. um, uh, the doctor's trying to poison. Yeah. Mm. so he's like then he kind of sorts that out then he goes well, running it was merely in a field it, to me it was more like they were leaving the poison sitting ah yeah yeah again alluding to the whole um, suicide thing yeah almost as if that was what we complete or either uh, as if that completes our transition into being a vampire you know committing suicide uh huh Aye. So I mean, so again, taking away from really the bite thing that you mm. seem obsessed with Gary right and made it more of a kind of like um, a lost soul Causing, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The eternal damnation of becoming a vampire. Aye. He's still on the right. Aye, so uh, he's running through a field and he falls over. You did. Maybe he's feeling a bit faint and then he sits down on the bench and then he splits his kind of spirit or aye, ghost or something. Aye. So that's maybe an explanation for that. So what do you think the, the significance of him being in the coffin is? Uh, I, really, I don't know. Because it is revealed that that's not actually reality. Yes, because uh-huh. when, when we go back to the bench, I mean, they disappear. He's getting taken away in a cloak off, and that does. But um, I mean, loads of things went through my head when I saw that. And um, one of them was, okay, so he's actually dead, right? right? Something's happened to him when he's given blood, mm. and they've killed him, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, or 
it's been him that's been the vampire all along. You know, I was just was I didn't know right. quite what was happening. Or the vampire, you know, they said about the the vampire drinking the blood mm-hmm. and be, like, maintaining like almost youth or whatever. Ah. This was back when I thought it was still a dude. And right. I thought maybe maybe all of a sudden the vampire looks like him because that's where the blood oh, went. Right. He's not giving the blood to uh, Leon. Yeah. He's giving it to the vampire to drink. Mm. Um, but it was none of them. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and I'm glad because that, those were kind of rubbish. But like, yeah, that I was just thinking, what's going on? You right, know? aye. Um, yeah, it's just an interesting yeah. scene. I think um, that section shifts back to Grey's kind of subjective point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, because the, re- the scene, the kind of middle of the film, you get the most uh, sort of all the characters there, so it's going to set up as a bit more objective. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know what yeah. it means. I think it's just to kind of toss it up in the air and <clears throat> mix, uh, mix it up. When when the, the t- we're talking about the vampire attack, you know, when we see Leon out in the, the woods Aye. and they go and try and find her, like uh, Grey and the sister go and try and find her, mm-hmm. and then they find her. And then they wait till the housekeeper and the nun come and they let them carry her back to the house. Right. <laughs> you, I was just like, and they were, he goes back to the house and they're standing back, letting them take her. And I thought, it's a bit ignorant, isn't it? <laughs> would you do that? You know, <laughs> I mean, I, th- I would have thought that, that, you know, Alan would have stood up and like, been like, I'll help you. Uh, <laughs> what kind of size of bedroom did that nun have as well? Um, and Doctor said, none. "Sister, go to bed." And then oh, she was into that wee cupboard in the other side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and then she's just waiting to come out. She doesn't hear any of the commotion that's going on. And then she just runs out. Aye. Oh, um, that's it. some. Some of it did seem like there was parts of it that were weren't just from his perspective that kind of seemed more like it wasn't a dream. It was more real, like you know, with the housekeeper t- saying. You know, make sure she doesn't die before sunrise. Think you know things yeah. like that that were kind of more again yeah. playing back into the traditional vampire film. Um, but it was that scene. The, the scene with the disembodiment was yeah. It was that was the first as the point that I was like, this something you know, there's maybe something else going on here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, dry Abbey's camera work as well kind of plays into that. Like Tony Rains points this out in the commentary. Right? It's got it's a, a POV shot. Mm-hmm. Uh, of grey and then you're looking at something and then the camera moves back and he's not there uh, yeah, always, it's yeah. like it starts as his POV and then it splits off mm-hmm. into some something else mm-hmm. uh, which is pretty don't think you've ever really seen that before some of the other things Dryer does with the camera are a bit strange like there's not really many establishing shots in the film No. what he mm-hmm. tends to do is that he'll uh, just pan the camera like from one side of the room to another, mm-hmm. which is quite, um, you can't quite get settled on the sort of space that you're in, which is quite disturbing. Like yeah. We're used to like knowing exactly where everything is in mm-hmm. traditional film style. Um, and a lot of the cutting is quite uh, jarring. It's like not quite continuity cutting. You're kind of, it's kind of weird angles he decides to use. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it all adds up to a kind of creating a, a strange mood and like atmosphere. And, like quite Definitely. Like, Something really unsettling mm-hmm. about the film. Um, so Definitely I liked all, that a lot. Yeah, it all builds towards the kind of the atmosphere of yeah. the film. It really does. Uh, it was maybe too much at the time because I don't think the film was very well received. Um, oh, really? Yeah, people didn't like it at the time. I think it led Dreyer to have a, a nervous breakdown. Oh, really? <laughs> then he didn't make films for something like his next film was 1947. Oof. Yeah. That's a big... uh, yeah, because it was too much. I mean, if you've got Dracula. Which is the, uh, I guess. the sort of archetypal classic narrative style, and mm-hmm. then this, it's like, what the fuck's this? What this, this? You might look at that and think this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah, the cutting's all over the place. The camera works weird. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I guess you could. I was going to say you could see this. You could see it being the kind of equivalent of today's, like mockbusters. Right. You know how you get these yeah. like, like asylum released, like. Uh, but I, I don't want to see that because that you know because those are really cheap and nasty. Right. Whereas this is this is totally not. But mm. like, you could see how it would maybe be. Oh, there's somebody went out with his pals with his video camera, yeah. you know, and made a vampire <laughs> film. Um, compared to like something like Universal Dracula, yeah. you know, you could see how that could be a perception that mm-hmm. people would have, which is a shame because as I say, it's again maybe looking at it with the the, the kind of fresher eyes of being oversaturated with the vampire lore yeah 
now you know what i mean looking mm-hmm. at it maybe it's easier to look at it fresher mm. whereas then like dracula was new and it was a very lavish and big take on it yeah even like i mean it was still very much in line with the kind of nosferatu yeah story i mean because i mean they basically rip, ripped it off um so you could see how that people would maybe have preferred you know the vampire film was a bit more straightforward yeah yeah especially in that in, in, with the kind of sound coming in and stuff like that i mean I mean, I'd, I'd, who knows what it would have been like going from like a silent film into like something sound and trying then trying mm. to also work with kind of unconventional narrative. Mm. Um, but like, I mean, I, 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 for me watching this, I didn't, I wasn't the narrative. It didn't feel that at all to me. The only bit that felt a little kind of jarring was when it went out body, body experience. And, right, you know, okay. like, after watching stuff like last year at Marion Bad and stuff yeah. like that, just this. This is totally easy, you know. What I mean, it's just like really easy to watch. You know what I mean? It's, it's it was so. Um, I found it quite comforting to watch. Uh, if you know what I mean, like, nah. I didn't feel that the narrative style was jarring at all. Mm-hmm. I, th- I thought it all worked yeah. pretty well. Um, but I guess, as you say, compared to something like Dracula, nah. it would have been very, very different. Mm. Can't believe that. That's like what, like sixteen years without making a film. Just doing some looking there, Gary, and you've fucked up again. Did that. Uh, it was 1943, oh, right. his next film. Not quite as bad, but still still a big break, man. Yeah. You know I mean, it's just over 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a long time for... I mean, he wasn't the most prolific director yeah. in the light world, but I mean, he still made, you know, two or three years between most of his films. Mm. Um, yeah, I think he's he was making like a film a year at the start in mm-hmm. his career, and then he had about five years between Passion and this, four years in terms of production, maybe. Sure. Um yeah, then he kind of slowed down. But uh, that last stage of his career, like Passion Joan of Arc, Vampire, or De- Day of Wrath, Gertrude, absolutely magnificent films. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Passion Joan-, Joan of Arc is one I'm really wanting to Aye. check out. But yeah, I mean, this I see, this was really refreshing. As I, said, I was, was looking forward to watching it. And even if I'd got like kind of a similar, similar thing to Nostra, I wouldn't have been disappointed. Mm. But this really, it really... You know, uh, I was pleasantly surprised. Yeah. You know, not not that I thought it was going to be bad, but mm-hmm. um, I mean, you you hadn't really given me much of a description. You'd said it was kind of a vampire film right, okay. type. You know what I mean? Yeah. Obviously, the title's out right out there. Um, and as I say, it still works as a vampire film completely. Mm-hmm. You're just not getting the kind of the big tropes that we have. You know, so we so. What's the word? So familiar with now. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're getting a kind of unique take on it. Mm-hmm. So how did you, like, come upon, like, this film? Like, really? Um, Criterion Cast. Re- yeah, yeah, just We like... did an episode on it. Right. Um, that's what, the first time I'd heard of it. What about Dryer? Is that, Dryer was that this his first film or you'd heard of, sorry, or? Um, I think it must have been... Yeah. I think the first one I saw was Passion June of Arc, so... I think I'd maybe heard the dryer through he's a big influence on Von Trier. Right. Uh-huh. Maybe heard his name. Mm-hmm. Um Yeah, and this was I think the second film as I saw. So like as I say, like this is definitely one to me that holds holds up as much as um something like Nosferatu, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um in fact, I mean in both of those films, the fact that they're almost nearly lost completely. Mm. Um is unthinkable, but it definitely makes me want to check out Passion of Joan of Arc. Yeah. Um, and what was it? There's this one after this? Uh, Day of Wrath. Day of Wrath. Um, or Debt is uh, my favourite maybe of his last three. Sure. They're quite similar in uh, the way they tell us, set up a story. Sure. Um, I mean, it's interesting when this film came out, it's still early as a horror. Yeah. Uh, uh-huh. For such, to make such a kind of unconventional film mm-hmm. uh, and kind of break down the horror genre before it even began it's kind of yeah, interesting I've seen uh, that when you were saying about the whole Nightmare on Elm Street thing yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know because um, um, I mean you had the whole German expressionism which was with Nosferatu was obviously a mm-hmm. out and out horror yeah. and then the other type those films they had kind of horror elements they were kind of dark stories uh, about kind of like, weird doctors and stuff yeah like grim fairy tales all, yeah, yeah, yeah. like kind of dark uh, but then it wasn't really until the universal cycle that horror was really established um mm-hmm. So definitely a definitely an achievement. Mm-hmm. Um, 
a great companion piece to Nosferatu, mm-hmm. I'd say. Um, just the fact that the way the approach to the story is so different. Some technical uh, achievements, which are very interesting stuff Definitely. going on. Definitely an interesting watch. I definitely enjoyed it, and it will be getting bought, I think, in the next Criterion right. sale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that Criterion set is um, it's a beautiful set. Yeah, yeah. It gets um, quite a lot of good, it's good the original script as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and yeah. as well as the mm-hmm. uh, Carmilla, the, the, the book it was kind of semi-based on. Yeah. Um, I wonder if, it were, if they'll upgrade it to Blu-ray or not. It's no one that's... The condition of the film yeah, isn't great. Um it, it, you could get so, like maybe seventy percent of the film, you get a little more out of it. Yeah, but there's some parts of it that are just kind of pretty damaged. Mm. I thought um, yeah. I was thinking that when I was watching. I don't know how much more you would get out yeah. of it for a Blu-ray. I don't know if it's like it's one of the ones that Criterion has near the top of the list of upgrades they're sure. planning to do, but uh, mm. I definitely pick it up if it get released. Yeah. Um, get some out. I think um, unfortunately it's been pretty bad way, but. Mm. Maybe even uh, clear those those scenes up a little bit, you know the yeah. the ones because if, if there's maybe some, crimp, I mean the 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 bit rate was pretty high Aye. for most of the film. I was checking that out, so you might not get that much more out of it, mm. but like even you know a smidge, yeah, like clear those uh, kind of scratched up no- noisy scenes up a little bit. The the external shots mostly mm-hmm. wasn't it, um, but yeah, yeah, it's on Masters of Cinema as well. Yes, which you might that's pick right, up because it's got a Guillermo del Toro commentary yeah mm-hmm. which, um, uh, it's got a nice booklet with that as well aye. I think it's it's not as big as the Criterion mm. one but I think it's different ratings so it's not right, like, yeah. it's going to be a repeat uh, that was one I, like, I was planning to pick up because uh, I've got the Master Cinema Nosferatu one right aye. and I was planning to pick up the Vampire at one point but I was wanting to kind of check it out first mm-hmm. I'm trying to stop blind buying <laughs> <laughs> Um. so is that us wrapped on Vampire I think that's all we can say yeah yeah Um. if you've seen Nosferatu definitely check this out it's mm. As Gary says, it's a a nice alternative take. You're not going to be seeing the same stuff again, but uh, it's definitely evoked the similar feelings in me that I had, you know, the first time I watched Nosferatu. And if you're a bit kind of sick and tired with the vampire lore and mm-hmm. the twilightness of it, this is a, a something a little different to sink so. your teeth into if you. <laughs> pardon the pun. <laughs> I'm just going to pun the way through the rest of the, <laughs> the podcast. All right. Okay, so now we'll move on to random shit. Our favourite segment, Gary. Yep. If you're listening for the first time, this is where we discuss Blu-ray news, movie news, what we've been watching and buying, stuff like that. Basically, you know, that's what it says in the tin. That's random it. shit. Um, any kind of points that we decide to bring up, like conversation points, usually me, because yes. Gary doesn't actually want to talk to me. Um <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah. I dread this every week. Every two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> every week, kill it. It's about two weeks, motherfucker. Yeah, uh, it feels like every week. So, Gary, I know you're itching here to give me your news. Mm. Um, well, just one thing I wanted to bring up. I just uh, mentioned the Criterion's November sure. slate of releases. Right. Uh, I posted a link on Facebook. Yes. About it. Um, so the link, I don't remember if I yeah, followed it or just, not. Just uh, it's a couple of titles I'm excited about. Jean-Luc Godard's Weekend oh, on yeah. Blu-ray uh-huh. uh, from 1967. That's our last film from his, uh, what's regarded as his classic period, 60s period, sure. where at the end of that film he declared end of cinema. Oh, right. And he <laughs> moved away from making narrative films for like 20 years. Right. Um, yep, so I'm going to pick up that. Uh, also, uh, Akira Kurosawa's Rashomon on Blu-ray. Mm. Is that a book, Gary? What's it about? Uh, it's about, uh, I think it's a princess who gets uh, attacked and, and raped. Right. But it's got an interesting structure. It was, I think, one of the first films to do this type of thing where it tells the story from four different perspectives. Oh, okay, yeah. And yeah. It, you don't know what one's uh, the, real. the real one. Hmm. Uh, but your news for this week? That's me, yeah. What you got this week, Sam? Um, I've, I've got a couple of things. Um... Disney, I believe, have announced that they're releasing Pocahontas in Blu-ray. Have yeah. you seen this film, Gary? I haven't seen it. It's one no. I haven't actually seen. No, I've never seen it. It never ever appealed to me. Right. Do you know why? Why is that? I didn't fancy Pocahontas. Okay. Right, now, because, like, all the rest of them, you know what I mean? Except for Snow White, she always seemed a bit young to me. Right. But, like, Ariel, 
Bell, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Even even like sleep you know, Sleeping Beauty, what was her name, Aurora? Mm-hmm. Um Cinderella less. She's a bit a classy bird, do you know what I mean? Um but Pocahontas, don't know. It's weird because the last it played her, I remember when when they made it, you know, they did yeah. all the kind of behind scenes stuff and Mel Gibson's obviously in it and stuff like that. But the the, the girl that did her voice, uh-huh. totally hot. Alright. Pocahontas. Nah, that's mm. much. So anyway, I never ever saw it. Never really appealed to me. Um, but it's coming out and Disney are bringing that out in a, a, a I believe, a, a diamond. I uh, know, I don't think it's a diamond. All right, fuck you then. Is it not one of the classics? Uh, I don't know. It's definitely not a diamond edition. No? No. Nah. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, because I think in America it's coming out with Pocahontas 2. Oh, right, right, right. Um, what about the Rescuers that's coming out as well? That, yeah, the two of the Rescuers mm-hmm. films. Um, yeah. Strange waste wasting money, is it? fine. <laughs> Uh, also, the rescuers is coming out in a, uh, a double pack with rescuers too. Right. Is that a diamond one? Do you think? No, it? no. It's strange the ones they class as diamond. Mm. Uh, there's a few odd choices. Mm-hmm. And then they always uh, move it about. Cause, yeah. Like Dumbo's not a diamond, which is weird. Yeah, it's a seventieth anniversary, isn't it? Uh, I I don't know. Uh, yeah, I might well, pick that up. But the uh, Pocahontas. Aye. Right. Yeah, you, the, you, you released a few recently. You weren't a big fan of the rescues, weren't you? Nah, not really. No, I always quite liked uh, that. The, se- the sequel was alright, but this, I, thought, I always liked the first right. one. I thought it was quite dark, but mm. um, I don't know. I would like to see Pocahontas, but I've never, I was never really into it. Right. Mm. Also, we know about my love for the Halloween films. Mm-hmm. I reported on recently uh, that Halloween 2 and 3 have been released by Shout Factory. Yep. Um, nice new additions but um, Anchor Bay or Stars whatever they're called in the States have just released Halloween 4 and 5 when Bloody Halloween 4 is like the kind of I think even you said when you saw it it was kind of the better the best sequel right. yeah. that, you know t- you know um, they just released them in the States and I was thinking about picking them up and especially now as news flash I've just purchased my new multi-region Blu-ray player it's not here yet but I've got it <laughs> um, and they're region A Okay. Right. So, but they get released. I think today, which is the twenty first, or either that or yesterday the twentieth, um, and they posted on their Facebook saying with it like you know coming soon, with the Union Jack behind it. Right. Um, fifteenth October. So, Halloween right. four and five are being released in the UK now from Stars or Anchor Bay, um, on fifteenth October. I remember. Do you remember like like I remember back in the day because like, Halloween was always kind of owned by Anchor Bay. Right. And like, they used to release like, the DVDs and stuff like that in the states, and like Anchor Bay didn't really do much over here. Okay. So it's weird, like you know, like you forget that they're just going to bring them out. Right. You know, because it's. Cause I was thinking about getting them for the states. Um. So that's good news for mm-hmm. Halloween fans. Going to have more or less the whole collection right. on Blu-ray. Some sad news. Um. Tony director Tony Scott died. Yeah. Um, apparently it was... Yeah, I heard uh, on the news, I think the day after, that it was maybe due to an, an inoperable brain cancer yeah, he had. Yeah, he, um, he threw himself off a, that's a bridge. I don't know if that's confirmed. Seems to explain it. it yeah, was a bit that kind of... Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah, Tony Scott, I, mean, I don't really care if his films that much, but um, mm-hmm. yeah. No, I get him, and I mean, as I said, I enjoyed Top Gun when I was younger and stuff right, like that. Yeah. It's kind of one of those classic kind of 80s films, isn't it? And, um, yeah. Apparently they were working on maybe doing number two oh, right, at yeah. some point. Um, so yeah, that's it's pretty sad. Mm. It's never nice to hear about that kind of no. stuff. But I've got a few dates for some stuff that's going to be on at the Glasgow Film Theatre oh, right. in Glasgow, mm-hmm. Scotland. Just it's kind of related to stuff we've spoke about. Um, on the fourth of September at quarter to nine, <laughs> Freaks is being shown. Really? Oh. Yeah. Um, so I was kind of I just was checking through the schedule. So that's one that maybe some folk might want to check out mm-hmm. if they haven't seen it or not. Maybe interesting to see on the big screen. Yeah. On the eleventh of September, Salo, right? Or a hundred and twenty days of sad Sodom. It's been shown about 20 past 8. Okay. Again, something we've spoke about before. Yeah. Um, on the 25th of September, they're showing Last Tango in Paris. Right. Uh, quarter past 8. you seen this film? Yeah, didn't care yeah. for it. I've never seen it. Uh, I know it's kind of notorious. It's a bit tedious, I think. Right, is it? Yeah, right. it's, and it's so, uh, the notorious scenes are so uh, tame. Right, right. Now, right, uh, right. Um, one for kind of 
maybe more mainstream kind of thing, I guess. Uh, Clockwork Orange has been shown on the 28th yeah. of uh, September at 11 o'clock. So there's just some films to check out. I thought it was quite interesting when I saw Freaks was shown. I thought Aye. that was kind of interesting. I wonder if it's in reaction to the podcast, you know? Could be. <laughs> or they folk, uh, requesting it. <laughs> My final piece of news is less a piece of news, more of just a discussion point. Well, I was reading a, an article on, on the internet um, and it was about Shia LaBeouf. Okay. And a supposed unsimulated sex scene he was going to be taking part in. So I clicked on it and right. I... I my mind instantly, for some reason, went to Lars von Trier. Right. And it's right enough. It's um, his new film, The Nymphomaniac. Nymphomaniac. Oh, yeah. I've seen it, right. Um, we're going to have Shia LaBeouf, Nicole Kidman, Charlotte Gainsbourg and Willem Dafoe. Right. Apparently all having unsimulated sex together. Right, right. Um, Kidman back in the fold, I didn't know. Uh, sorry? Kidman. Yeah. She was uh-huh. in Dogville. Yes, uh-huh, And uh-huh. then she was originally planned to do uh, the next sort of companion film, uh, Manderley. Mm-hmm. But she kind of, I don't know, they couldn't quite come to terms. Right. Well, I mean, this was uh, this was one news report I'd read. Um, basically, it was mostly from Shia's like perspective, um, saying that he, he, you know, he got the the script and it basically says at the top, it's um, you know, we're doing in commas the sex for real, you know, right, okay, um, and anything illegal is going to be blurred out. It's it's going to be shot, but it's going to be blurred out. I don't know what like, they mean by illegal, but. Hmm. I guess anal sex is illegal in some states. Right. But, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, so it's apparently about like a yeah a woman like um, Gains it's Charlotte Gainsbourg and her like sexual encounters from the, you know a young age to her fifties. Okay. So I don't know if Kidman's going to, but Kidman's like, what in her forties now. Uh I was I was thinking she's maybe going to play a young, but right. like I don't you know it's, it's mm. so I'm not sure <clears throat> who everyone's playing. Okay. But um. As I said, uh, it was those were the four names I kinda had involved with it. Um and he basically Shadow was saying like he's kinda done doing the kinda the Hollywood films really, you know, the big right, okay. um so there's no room for like visionary filmmaking. Um he's just kinda sick and tired of it. It's like you've seen that he quoted uh, if he like give Terrence Malick a movie like Transformers, like <laughs> couldn't they fuck up? You know what I mean? What would they do? You know what I mean? Right. Um, he'd, he'd just be fucked because there's no way for him to exist in that world. Right? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and he says like it was says about Von Trier. He's like he's he, feel, he feels like he's very dangerous. Mm. Um, and he's only he only wants to do stuff that kind of terrifies him. Right. You know what I mean? So that's why he's obviously kind of heading headlong into it. Um. I know, obviously, in Antichrist, there's like, like you know, it's like, but it's not, it's not Willem Dafoe and Charlie Gaines. No, it's there. not. Um, what's your thoughts on this film? Like, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I knew <laughs> Charlie Gainsbourg was in it. It's a two part. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me see. I read that somewhere today. Yeah. Oh no, maybe it's just it's it's been released in two versions. Right. A sexually explicit one and oh, a, right, okay. a, a censored one. Right. But cut down. Uh, yeah, I didn't know the those other uh, actors were in it. Um, so uh, yeah, any Von Trier um, is a highlight for me, and I think he's going to could be be doing something pretty extreme again. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I was talking uh, about it a wee bit. Um, well, I was talking to my wife about it because when I read the thing, she was quite surprised that Shia LaBeouf was doing, you know, the, right, like, uh, that kind of thing. Um, what do you feel? What you guy like? What do you feel the merit to having like, unsimulated sex in a film is? What do you feel the merit? You know, wh- when when do you think as a filmmaker you would be like, this has to be real? Um, you know, like I understand obviously that's basically you know the, the 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 film is about like sexual exploration and you know this mm. woman and stuff. So what? Why does it have to be real? You know? Yeah. I guess it's that debate between searching for a realism in film. You get the it's a spectrum between documentary. Like mm-hmm. If you push film to make it make for film film too realistic, then it becomes a documentary. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say, well, it kind of depends on what you're trying to go for with the story. Mm-hmm. Um, if the realism is going to add to the depth of the characters, if it's going to make it more impactful, mm-hmm. then go for it. Uh, generally. You would say the magic of cinema is you don't need to mm-hmm. do things for real. You don't need to have a real fight. You sure. can uh, use the techniques of cinema to 
and play it rather than actually do it. But um, I mean, I would say, why not mm-hmm, do it? Mm-hmm. Uh, nothing should be off limits sure. in terms of cinema for me, really. Uh, I guess if you put it towards that, the you know the merits of staging a fight to actually having a fight. Yeah. Um, I get, I get, I kind of get what you mean. You know, I can if I frame it that way. Mm-hmm. You know, why not do it for real? Almost, you know what I mean. Try and capture a moment. Yeah. Yeah, I can see it in that. But I was just wondering, yeah. you know, like what you know, where you're I mean, I guess with a film on Nymphomania, you're kinda I guess if they, if I was trying to push that. Yeah. Yeah, I can see. But I was just wondering what you thought the you know, what the merits were. Have you seen yeah. many films with like, real sex scenes in them? Um well Antichrist, um what else you got? Brown Bunny was got mm-hmm. a full issue mm-hmm. seen uh um, sure. I've never seen nine songs, but oh, that's aye, good, yeah. like, it was like kind of First mainstream with the with the um, money shot. Yeah, I mean when you see a something a film that does it for real, mm-hmm. it kind of hits you more because it breaks mm-hmm. out of that conventions of cinema. It's like Gummo. It's got the two brothers that kind of really yes, punch each other. Yes, that's I was going to talk about yeah, with the fighting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Aye, it's good to break down those walls sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it hits the audience a bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but um, as I say, I'm, I'm yeah. definitely. I mean, I've only really seen Men in Color. Obviously, I'm going to check out Antichrist, but I'm. I was still kind of. I was quite. I'm interested, you know, to right. see that, how this turns out. Mm-hmm. Um, see some kind of big names there attached to, it, like you know, so yeah. it would. I think it'll get a lot of publicity as well. Yeah. Um, Hopefully, it's not just hype though. I mean, not a nice white shot. I thing. know. Uh, yeah, that's the problem, but, isn't it? I was showing. Um, I was talking to my wife again about Lars von Trier and how LeBeouf saying, you know, he's dangerous and stuff like that or whatever. And I was saying, but he's, he's, he's such a nice guy. Like, right. You know, in the interviews I've seen of him, you know, he's such a kind of soft-spoken and kind of very gentle. Mm. Yeah, I don't know how he is as a director, but like certainly, um, I mean, Gainsborough's worked with him quite a few times, so mm-hmm. I don't think she would have kept going back if she didn't like him, yeah. you know what I mean? And I was showing her like a panel, I think it was for Melancholy, at, at, maybe it can, and he was talking about, I don't know if it was before he made the comment about Hitler right but he's talking about like yeah it was something that it was about he was talking about being he thought he was a Jew and then like yeah he turns out he's a Nazi yeah and there's one po- one point like where he's he says something and like no one really says it and he goes I'm joking or like he's like right. I'm joking and everyone kind of laughs and then he says something else and it's obviously a joke mm. but again so, no one's really kind of react I think because of the films he makes people just want to take him deadly seriously yeah you know what I mean he is total deadpan no, oh, he don't oh, quite oh know, yeah, yeah definitely but like some of the stuff <laughs> and he it says, loves just to be like that confrontational way where uh, just likes to rail people up and yeah. uh, shake the feathers. Totally. Uh, but I think you've just got to like kind of take it for, it's, it, you know what I mean? There's no yeah. way he's been like, <laughs> he's totally just taking the piss, you know what I mean? I think that's yeah. the thing. It's it's the whole shock factor, you know, uh, it's just kind of, but it'll definitely be interesting to see how that turns out anyway. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to that. I think that's all the news I've got. News slash discussion points. So will we move on to pickups? Okay. Because it's going to be a long one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not for me, but for you. Right, yeah, I've got a mega haul this yeah. time. Uh, been uh, well, working the old credit card. Yeah, you have. To the bone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I just do mine then and then get them out sure, of the way and then yeah. I'll just sit back and like not see anything for like half an hour. Right. <laughs> so, for my humble pickups, um, I partook in the Barnes & Noble Criterion sale for the first time ever even though at this point I didn't have a, a player to play them on <laughs> um, and I purchased a Shallow Grave which I think was just released fairly yeah, recently wasn't it? Yeah a few months ago yep. I think. Shallow Grave needed to say more you know mm. what I mean um, pretty awesome film apparently it's really nice looking as well yeah a lot better um, than the Final Four one yeah yeah some nice artwork as well like the kind of uh, tool the hardware store right, kind of yeah. aesthetic <laughs> That's awesome. Um, also picked up Dazed and Confused, uh, Richard Lintleaker's film, uh, which is a, a blind buy, but it's got some nice packaging, so I'll let it go. Um, I believe that's like a nice like, kind of school jotter mm. <laughs> kind of look to you know, a book and things like that, so that's nice. I'll hopefully get to see these soon. Um, I also picked up pretty cheaply, it was just a kind of random kind of a blind buy but I think it was like I got it for less than a fiver um, Inglorious Bastards or okay. Bastards a Tarantino film I'd seen it quite a few times but I wanted the limited edition right don't really get nothing with it <laughs> so, oh, yeah. so the, the DVD box is just the same okay right that's kind of nice the, the cover's kind of nice it's kind of embossed and kind of silver but you get some nice uh, art card things oh, yeah. 
that are like, you know, old films almost, you know, and kind of or like propaganda material. You know Aye. what I mean? It's kind of nice, nice stuff. Um, wasn't it bad for the price? And as I say, I was. Uh, wasn't he going to buy just the reggae edition? You know. Um, and that's it, guys. You know what I mean? Right. That's that's me, poor boy. You know. <laughs> um. Yep. I'll have more next time. <laughs> Joss is out, Joss is out next, next month, man. <laughs> you know, you pre ordered Joss. Oh, no, I didn't actually. You know what? No. Well, I've, I've pre ordered one. Well, no, See, if I don't like the steelbook, you know, it'd be there for you if you wanted right. it, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but I don't know what one I'm going to keep yet or not. Okay. I thought you'd pre ordered Joss. No, I didn't actually get around to it. Um, what about? I will pick it up at some point. Cool, man. Right, lay right. it on me. So, Oof. Uh, before I get into the Criterion Hall, sure. uh, I've got some other stuff as well. <laughs> <laughs> I also picked up the the Casablanca 70th anniversary Blu-ray box set, nice. uh, the massive white box. <clears throat> it's, uh, you see that was massive? Well, Gary. it's a big, a big white box. It doesn't say much for you guys to think that's massive. <laughs> That's a bit like eight, eight inches wide. Right, uh, I don't know if it's uh, massive, Gary. Okay, it's not just average. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody's got one of them, you know? Uh, yeah, <laughs> On that size. Right. <laughs> um, this box is go high. It's alright. It's, a, it's, yeah. a, it's a fair size, Gary. Uh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, it's the American release. Um, it's the second time it's on Blu ray, but this is just a new 4K scan. Right. Um, so I haven't checked out the print yet, but. <clears throat> meant to look pretty good mm. it's a beautiful box and you also get a hardback book another blu-ray with like loads of about seven hours of documentaries on Warner Brothers holy crap uh, and a DVD who wants that I don't know and coasters <laughs> coasters and a poster so, so the DVD just the DVD version of the film I think it's just a film I don't know if it has extras or... <gasps> friends got <laughs> out the window <laughs> yeah um, was I going to say like have you seen like sorry just to the divert like um I was looking for when I was looking for my player. Mm-hmm. There's some players that do like a two, like a four K upscale. Right, I heard that. Right. Um, is that Sony ones? I think it may have been a Sony. Right, that, I remember. That, I think Sony, that uh, a two K four K thing. It's okay. up, it's up to four K resolution. Right. Two K TV though is that any good? What? And I just asked ten eighty p TV. Is ah, yeah, that's what I think that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. But I don't know if it's maybe for well, but then even like bigger. I mean, you don't get much bigger than a two K. Even yeah. sc- screen size, you don't get any bigger, mm. do you? Or do you start to get in four K TVs? I don't know if they're on sale yet. Maybe in like if you had like a hundred inch TV, it might work a bit better. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, just a bigger size. I mean, is that like, even if it's displaying a higher resolution on on your mm. turkey resolution, it's not going to do anything. Mm. But maybe it's just forward proofing. Yeah. But I mean, we're already at this point where you're thinking they're thinking people haven't <laughs> properly up up taken two K yet. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, and they're thinking about getting about ahead of themselves. Aye. Anyway, sorry, that was just a side note. Yeah. So yeah. Been wanting that. I've been wanting that since it came out a few months ago. Um, I'm glad it arrived without any yeah. major dents or bumps. You, I believe you paid for it through the nose of you. Well, yeah, the, mm, I get hit with costings, but uh, it was a reduced oh, price. Sure, I sure. got it first, so. Oh no, I mean worth it. I mean it's yeah, it's, it's a gamble. A, I have been a fair the big box. Yeah, you know? I've been importing a fair bit, like a bit about four <laughs> packages in the last couple of months. Yeah, so. <laughs> but here's this current again. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> law of averages maybe. Yeah, but, I guess um, so. Yep. So nice. Nice, nice. I found another film I haven't seen. Right. Classic. Region A? Uh, I don't know. No, I bet what you have a DVD if you want. Like, you can have a DVD, you can press me with a DVD. <laughs> yeah. I don't want your DVD, Pish. Right, right so move on to my haul from the 50% off Barnes and Noble Criterion sure. sale. Yep. Um, can I just uh, stop for a wee moment to you know, say a little bit about our sponsors? Right. Criterion. Yes. <laughs> it to be, it's like it went from Arrow to like, being Criterion. Yep, sorry. See, Arrow are doing a bit of a sale at the moment. Uh, are they? Yeah, they have, um, most of the Blu-ray, well, not most of them, a lot of the Blu-rays, like Tenebrae and um, Phenomena, Vamp. Right. Uh, with the Crystal Plumage. Loads of those ones. Are, are, all, or they were there for like, seven ninety nine. All right. Um, from their website, the DVDs were three ninety nine or something okay. like that. So just a side note, I just remember. Aye. Don't know if it's, I don't know how long the sale's on for, but hopefully it'll be kind of similar to the one that they had in June when everything was like a fiver. Oh, aye. Or what, the DVDs were a fiver, sorry. Yeah. Hopefully. I might have picked something up. 
Okay, I got one DVD yes, to you start did. with. Hoot Dreams. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Normally, if it's a film I want a DVD from Criterion, I'll wait to the upgrade yeah. it. But this is probably won't upgrade it because it was yeah, shot in standard def that. video. Mm. So. This is the one I it's thought a great about documentary. picking up. Yeah. Um, can't believe I thought that was a real T-shirt. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on to Blu-rays. Okay. I got uh, America Lost and Found, the BBS story. Right. Which is a collection of films from BBS Productions. Uh, the early 70s okay. produced films like Easy Rider oh, right, uh-huh. Five Easy Pieces Last Picture Show uh, Specials features on all oh yeah loads of stuff were they released individually as well they weren't no, no. Oh, that's a nice set the way also got uh, Shallow Grave oh Copin Bastard <laughs> The Gold Rush oh yeah Charlie yeah. Chaplin mm-hmm. um, quite a good addition it also has the because there was two versions of the film right uh, from the 1925 version and then the 1942 so that's got the both of them in high definition mm. compared with the the UK Blu-ray only had the the 1942 version in high def and it had the the 25 on DVD I think true so mm, great team upgraded it uh, Down by Law uh, Late Spring done by Yasujiro Ozu oh right guy did Tokyo Story yeah, yeah, yeah. who's in the same sound, sound top 10 cool the Complete Monterey Pop Festival, uh, which includes Monterey Pop, a documentary about the festival, and okay. a, another Blu-ray with two live sets, Jimmy Plays Monterey and Shake Otis at Monterey. Oh, in high def, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Nice. Uh, Rushmore. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've, I've recorded that recently to check it out. Aye. Yeah, yeah um, that's, that's a good one. Uh, no, my favourite, Wes Anderson. But uh, all these films are mm-hmm. pretty good. Um, 39 Steps. Right, aye. You checked it out yet? I have. I've watched it. Is it good? It's okay. Better than the UK one? Yeah, was... I think it will be. It's from the same source. Right, right. Like the same print. Mm-hmm. I believe it's not the same transfer, but sure. uh, I think the ITV one had serious compression issues. Right. This looks, it looks pretty decent. It is a soft image. Right. Um, I, th- I think it's just a combination. Of, it was, was shot in that kind of softer style and then it's just it's a I think it's a master positive mm-hmm. that's transferred from um, so I don't know I'm guessing that's the best it can look because Criterion generally try and find the best that's yeah. available so it's a bit <coughs> they, they had a, a DVD a while ago of it didn't they aye yeah it was a different transfer wasn't it a, I'm not a mate yeah probably because it was quite a while it was early this on this is probably a new transfer yeah Playtime okay film by Jack Tatty not. He's like a sort of physical comedian. Is an influence of Mr. Bean. Really? Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you mean Ron Axon? Yeah. Well, the yeah, character. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mr. Bean's like, I'm going to make my life like him. I don't know. Hitchcock, Lady Vanishes. Oh, nice. Haven't watched this yet, but yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, oh, it's also got another feature length film. Oh really? Uh, yeah, disease cat. There's two characters in it called uh, Charters and Caldicott. They turned up in like a number of British films as like um, supporting characters right. in the period, uh, playing the same role. Uh, and then that's another film they were in. That's pretty cool. A bonus yeah. feature as another. Is that film. a Hitchcock film? No, no, no. It's just it's just yeah. The, the characters are in Lady Van- Lady Vanishes. Yeah, or? yeah, right, right. right. Yeah, it's a. Pretty big hole there, uh, Gary. Yeah. How many is that there? Um, two, three, the, four. <laughs> the box set. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Well, eleven titles. Yeah. What? Eleven. Seventeen. Eighteen Blu-rays. Oof, right. and, uh, no, that. seventeen Blu-rays on DVD. Sure. Uh Yeah. Yeah. So. Big. Yep. I think I won't be buying anything for a, a while. Well, hopefully, I'll say still. that. But uh, yeah, I know it's, it's <laughs> an, it is an addiction. It's, it's crazy, but whatever makes us happy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's us for this time, Gary. I think that's I think uh, else. Uh, well. I mean, we could talk about it. it doesn't have to be make it in, but we're talking about the Nosferatu thing. Remember, you know, the, yes, the German uh, release, the German, Italian. I think Italian spent are coming out. Um, yeah. There was a guy on the forums in Blu-ray dot com that Aye. he said a couple of times that the his company are are doing a rest or HD restoration. Yeah, I've seen. I saw that thread. Aye. I don't think that's the same people that are putting out this. All right. Blu-ray. 
Um, there's one picture I showed you. He had like, the negative or like the film. Oh, aye. Not negative, sorry, not negative, but it was like a print. At right, least, okay. at very least, a print of it. Right. Um, he had the reels, you know, sitting right. out. Um, so I don't know how what you know what they're doing as well. Mm. Um, I was led to believe that was like in the states at least. Right. Okay. Um, so I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how that. Turns yeah. Out. Because someone said like, the last restoration was standard def. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's accurate or not. Mm. I don't know when that was done. Yeah. I don't know what that print was that, that guy had, whether that was a restoration print. Mm. Yeah, because um, do you know the best prints that are available? Is it just release prints that are still in existence? So. I think so, because I think, I mean, yeah. Because I'm trying to... It's it's not one of the films that like there was you know the there was those films that have been found in private collections over the uh, years that had like you know amazing prints that were you know locked away for years. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's just kind of what we've got. It's kind of almost the best. Yeah, because it was illegal battles mm-hmm. that destroyed the they all get destroyed, didn't they? Mm-hmm. I mean the the, uh, the mass cinema restoration I think it was 1998. Okay, so I mean that kind of predates the kind of high def. Mm. You know what I mean? Maybe yeah. it's not something they would have been thinking. You know, maybe, maybe if it was done, know. maybe in the, even the VHS era. Because mm-hmm. I, don't know. I mean, if they've restored the print to a point, they maybe just t- took an, an SD scan yeah. of it, you know, mm. a transfer. Mm. So it's maybe something that just it makes you wonder why they wouldn't have done it. I mean, Master Cinema, you'd think that'd be one they would go for, wouldn't you? Yeah. But um, it'd be interesting to see what these other companies do. It might be something that will come this side of the pond. Yeah. That was all, really. Um, so what are we going to be looking at next time Gary so next time on Cinema Subculture we're looking at Antichrist yep from last um, one to year mm-hmm. that's a film I'm look, very much looking forward to yeah, watching I'm, I'm, let I'm me excited down. for you to see it <laughs> better not let me down Gary <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I've been kind of like I saw him in Collier and I've been kind of wanting to see this film ever since yeah. so um, really excited to hopefully mm. another film that uh, sparked a sort of uh, ban this filth Oof, yeah, uh, scandal uh, in Britain anyway yeah. um, so we'll bring that up next time I think ironically released uncut in the UK <laughs> as well eventually <laughs> um, cool well I'm definitely looking forward to that that's one I've been wanting to see for a while yep um, remember if there's anyone who's new to the podcast just maybe hearing us for the first time or if you've been listening for a while and you've not went along um, we've got a Facebook page it's facebook.com forward slash cinema subculture we've got an email address um, cinema underscore subculture at hotmail.com um, we've also got like a blog um, which is cinema subculture dot blogspot dot com I think it is um, the Facebook directs to it anyway so if you go there uh, keep you know tuned for updates maybe upcoming schedule um, maybe some competitions depending if we can get that off the ground um, in general just like kind of interesting news which Gary keeps on top of some nice pics and some trailers for the films we're going to be looking at yeah check it out so join us next time on Cinema Subculture thanks for listening and leave it uncut Mayor.